Hi, welcome to Think Bigger, Think Better. Today we have Bill Schmarzo, also known as the Dean of Big Data, who is both quite a character and someone who has blazed a path in helping the world become more data-driven through his practice-based research on how to use data science and business. But first, a bit of housekeeping for me. Think Bigger, Think Better is funded through Patreon, and I'm thankful to my newest patron, Ram Patabiraman. Sorry about that, Ram, if I messed that up, from Australia. If you're listening on Patreon, consider 2 or 5 or $10 a month to keep supporting the show. Upcoming episodes will be on plastics in the ocean, on artificial intelligence, and one on meaning and purpose at work. Uh, I'm personally hard on the conference trail with gigs in Hong Kong, Denmark, Cali, and California coming up. Uh, it's good they don't have conferences in sucky places, that's all I can say. Uh, I have a new speaker teaser reel on paulgibbons.net under keynotes, which is a four-minute thing of my greatest hits. If you're interested in recruiting a speaker, check that out. And finally, I have a book coming out called Meeting and Purpose, which reviews the idea of bringing spirituality to work and workplaces. Look for that book to come out in mid-February. And if you want to be kept up to date on podcasts, blogs, books, and conferences, sign up for my mailing list on paulgibbons.net. And thanks for that. And now on with the show. First of all, I'm going to embarrass uh, Bill by telling uh -oh. listeners a little bit about him. He's regarded as one of the top digital transformation influencers on big data and data science. He's got 30 years in data warehousing. Well, you got old, dude. 30 years in data warehousing, <laughs> <laughs> business intelligence, yeah. and advanced analytics. I know it's right. I, so when I say I began my career in the 70s, I think, Jesus, 45 years ago. Um, and uh, <laughs> he's at... Uh, Hitachi Bantara uh, guides the company's tech strategy and drives co-creation efforts with certain customers to leverage IoT and analytics and to help them power their digital transformations. Bill was formerly CTO of Big Data at Dell, where he formulated the company's big data practice strategy, identifying target markets and solution frameworks. He's a prof at the University of San Francisco School of Management and an honorary professor at the School of Business and Economics at the National University, to be sure, of Ireland, in Galway. Jesus. Galway, yes. <laughs> that must be fun, man. That's a very beautiful place. Oh, that's, yeah, it is gorgeous. Yeah. And you teach courses on big data and an MBA, driving business strategies and data science, thinking like a data scientist. And you're the author of Big Data, Understanding How Data Powers Big Business, and Big Data MBA, Driving Business Strategies, with data science. So, dude, when do you sleep? <laughs> and I even have I even got a third book out. I just uh, I released a couple of months ago called The Art of Thinking Like a Data Scientist that I have um, making available um, only as an ebook. It's um, which is a new adventure for me. I thought I'd try something where I would publish myself. And um, well, I'm learning as I go. Well, I love it. I have it open on my on my desktop right now. I, I find it helpful, actually, when I'm talking to people and interviewing them to have read their books. It's a strange thing. <laughs> not, everybody, not, not everybody does that. But aren't uh, traditional publishers all over you like a cheap suit trying to get you to publish it on Sh Simon & Schuster or one of the big business publishers? You tell them they got lost? Yeah, but yeah, but I, I, I wanted to self-publish this one because I could control the price point. Oh, and okay. I, I, work, I work with students and... You know they can't afford fifty or sixty bucks for a textbook, and so you know I got a price at like fifteen bucks. It's, you know, it's yeah. designed as a workbook, and um, I can change the price based on when I need to change it so that people can get it. I, you don't make money on books, right? You just use well, books to, uh, to help build uh, community. Yeah, you know that's right, and I, I want to tell listeners it's an incredibly practical and useful book. Uh, and uh, if it's 15 bucks, that's great. I had a terrible experience with traditional publishing. They charge $55 for my book, uh, which I think is stupid, and there are equivalent books from Harvard professors for 18 bucks. So I don't know. They just seem to have failed economics one-on-one, -on -one, some of these people. But anyway, let's make our work available. Let's get it out there in the world. And I appreciate you're like a really, uh, if I can get personal, you're kind of a mission-driven guy, right? I mean, this isn't just like something you do for work. This is like the center of the core of you. Yeah, I, I think, Paul, it shows you how boring my life really is. I, <laughs> I, really, I really do like this stuff. Um, I, I, get a lot of, I get a lot of joy in this whole area of um, you know, working with customers and working with students, trying to figure out how do you leverage data and analytics, how do you blend together different 
you know, concepts. How do you bring economics into this play? How do you bring design thinking into this play? And, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm a boring person. who I'm a, I'm a one-trick pony. I only do kind of one thing, but I really enjoy it. Yeah, well, that's good. That's good. That related a lot to my book that's coming up on having meaning and purpose in your work. Like, it's, for you, it's like super connected. Like your purpose in life and your purpose at work aren't divorced from one another. You don't leave your purpose and meaning, you know, at the door of the house when you go out on a on a Friday morning. You take them to work with you. Amen. Amen, brother. So let me ask you some questions then. Uh, let me fire on the questions. So, so like you're a kid in college, you've got your head somewhere up your backside, and um, wh why should you think about becoming a data scientist? Why should a kid in college today think about data science as a career? So I'm not sure one would want to become a data scientist. I don't think data science as a career is where I advise people to go. Uh -huh, I, think, I, I, think, I think everybody needs to understand the concepts behind data science. Right. I think every job in the future is going to involve understanding how to use analytics to drive your profession, whether your profession is you know, an accountant or a nurse or a teacher or a tech. I mean, whatever your job is going to be in the future, data and analytics is going to be part of it. So I, I don't think I'd recommend a lot of people become data scientists as much as I'd recommend that I think that everybody needs to think like a data scientist, that you need to transform how you look at your job from a lens of how can data and analytics help me be more effective at my job. All right, well, let's take the question this way then. You're in a job and you're a middle manager and you're 30 or you're 35 years old, like most of the people who take your classes, and you've heard about this thing called data science and you really, you know, you're hearing that from the chief executive and we're going to be a data-driven company and we're going to have digital transformation. How do you, what's the first steps you would take to a manager and say, this is how you begin to add data science to your portfolio of skills? How do you do that? Well, I think the I think the first thing to do is you need to understand what data science is and what it isn't. And so um, this whole idea of you simplifying what data science is, and, and I think a real simple definition of data science is this. Data science is about identifying those variables and metrics that might be better predictors of performance. Yeah. Period. That's all it is, right? You don't need a 600-page book. You don't need to buy my overly priced book, right? That's all data science is. How do you identify those variables and metrics that might might be better predictors of performance? And so if I can, and, and not only with you know, 30 and 35 and 40 year olds, but in particular with MBA students, they grok this stuff right away. It's yeah. like, yeah, this is pretty simple stuff. How do you think about data and analytics from, from more of an economics perspective than I think about it from a technology right. perspective? Interesting, so, <laughs> so what's the, I mean, I know you teach some of these courses, so you're sort of selling your own wares in a way, but what's a good introduction? Like, what's the best introductory book that someone could pick up and say, this is how I take the first step, or what's the best introductory one-week course? Is there such a thing? Well, I think the best book, and it's the book, not the movie, it's the book Moneyball. Oh, now, fascinating. If you got, if you got a familiarization with, with baseball, yeah, the book Moneyball is a marvelous lesson in data science. So they don't bill it that way. They talk about analytics, but in there is buried all these really interesting nuggets uh, that are very applicable for data science. Let, let me give you a really good example. Yeah, you've all we've all watched baseball games, right? And nowadays, we'll see the infield and in certain for certain batters shift. Right, they move everybody over to the right-hand side. The third baseman's playing shortstop, and the shortstop's out playing on the second base. They shift over. Right. Well, what the, what the companies have done, they built a very detailed profile on every batter. They built a like, digital twin for each batter, and they know where that batter is likely to hit the ball. They've got propensity scores. And so throughout the book Moneyball, there's all these subtle examples of how data science is being used in baseball to change the game. And so I think Moneyball is a marvelous introduction to some data science concepts, though I don't think the word data science is used anywhere in the book. You know, it's funny, I worked with that dude in, uh, in, um, in the 80s at Solomon Brothers, Michael Lewis. He's a genius at translating complex oh. concepts into, I mean, he's, a, he's, he's just a, yeah, anyway, what a guy. Anyway, so what's another example for Moneyball? Don't they use it uh, uh, to select players in unusual ways? Like, uh, people were using their guts. They had these, these uh, what do they call them? Uh, recruiters, what do they call a recruiter in baseball? Scouts. Oh, the, scouts, yeah. And yeah, and the scouts use their gut, and they would look at a picture, and they'd say, oh, you know, he's got a good arm, or he's got a good feel, or he's got 
they were using their guts and their 30 or 40 years of experience. And this guy came in and said, we're going to use data. Like, do you remember an example from the movie of how that was so successful? Well, I'll give you a, I'll give you a real world example. All My right. son was, was a pitcher who played in the Orioles system for a while. Um, never got out of high A, but still, you know, was in the, was a professional baseball player. And I remember going to a scout day and watching the scouts gather around and, and he was on the mound pitching and there's a bunch of older scouts. They come up and they bring in their lawn chairs and they set it up and they bring out their stopwatches and they're going to time his, they're going to measure his pitch velocity to a stopwatch. And I kept thinking that's, that is, that's idiotic. I mean, you're totally dependent upon the, and these guys were old, the ability for them to click and click. Yes. When, yes. you know, the, the modern scouts are using, of course, the, the radar guns. Yeah. And so, I think there's there's a lot of organizations. I mean, baseball is full of stories of, you know, you 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 draft players because they look like a baseball player. And Billy Bean himself was the classic example of somebody who came up through the ranks in high school, and he I mean he looked like a baseball player. And so they drafted him, and he ended up being a baseball flop. And he was just a perfect example of why you can't you can't make decisions on based on what someone looks like. You need to look at the numbers themselves to make those determinations. Right, and the world is changing that way for the better, I think. Um, I'm, I'm always like, um, uh, one of the things that uh, I wrote in one of my books was that, uh, that one of the things they do is they uh, try and pay teachers more to incentivize them to work in bad neighborhoods. And they spend hundreds of millions of dollars on incentive programs. But of course, that's only one variable in what predicts the performance of a student is how good the teacher is. If it's a shit school and if it's a shit neighborhood or shit parenting or, you know, all of the other factors that confound it. And what you end up doing is throw mo throwing money at a problem and wasting it. And businesses do that all the time, right? By making decisions based on guts or things that look right. Um, no, that, that's why, by the, by the way, Paul, I believe that, you, um, well, I, I say that you know, not everybody should become a data scientist. I think everybody should understand economics. So you can make decisions like that. I mean, you look at how does, you know, making public policy shouldn't be based on hearsay and emotional feelings. It yeah. should be based on data and economics, right? What, is, what makes economic sense? Yes. Um, and when you, when you start using data and economics to make decisions, I think you're going to find all kinds of great things. So I think even more important than a data science degree is an economics degree, or at least an economics awareness, so people understand how value or wealth is created and how they can then use data and analytics to create value or wealth. Yes, yes. So one of the things I love from your book, by the way, is your maturity index. Uh, can you talk mm -hmm. people through that a little bit? Uh, and, sure. And also, I guess, it's kind of abstract as a model, but like where you see businesses, where's the center of gravity if you want of current businesses on the maturity index? Well, the reason why we created the, the, the why I created the Big Data Business Model Maturity Index because when I would, would talk to customers, I'd ask a very, very simple question, which is how effective is your organization at leveraging data and analytics to power your business models? <laughs> and most people bl blank stares. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was like like lobsters crawling on my ears. People had they had no idea how to answer that. And I mean, the, the reason why they had no idea is that they didn't know what good looked like. They had no idea what to expect. So I created the Big Data Business Model Maturity Index. It's not a maturity, it's not a maturity index based on how good you are at SQL or TensorFlow or Kafka or any one of these technologies. It's a measure of how effective you are at leveraging the, the value right. of data and analytics to really drive your business. And so what I found is as I talked to customers and did some research, thanks to you know, having a bunch of people at USF who are students and willing to do all kinds of work for you for free, we found that customers tended to sit along five different spots along the maturity model, right? And the, the first spot, the lowest pot, is like we call the business monitoring phase, which is people are using data and analytics to monitor what happened on the business, sort of a retrospective view of the business. And approximately 98% of the companies we talked to were stuck on that phase. They sure. weren't able to, be, to launch off that to become more predictive, more prescriptive, to drive Automation yeah. to drive new monetization opportunities. <coughs> Excuse me, <coughs> mm. battling the cold. So what we found as part of that research is that traditional BI data warehouse vendors were all trying to throw new technology to help organizations cross this analytics chasm to become more predictive, more prescriptive. And it, but it wasn't an it wasn't a technology challenge. You couldn't throw 
database servers at it. You couldn't throw more reporting and dashboards tool. It wasn't the technology that was falling into the chasm. It was the fact that organizations didn't understand the economics of data and the economics of analytics to drive new sources of value. And so when you started to apply the economics of data and analytics, by the way, at a very granular level, right, like we learned from, from Moneyball, right, it's not about it's not about trends and markets. It's about individual customers and what they're most likely to buy. It's about individual products, what's likely to break. It's about individual operations, which ones can I optimize? And when you start doing it individually, applying a data analytics, you had, a, you had a chance now to sort of leap over this chasm to start predicting what's likely to happen, to start prescribing corrective actions in order to optimize. So when we take this economic focus, it allowed us to cross this chasm that throwing more and more technology at would never cross. And so, and that's, and, how, and, that's how, that, and, and that's how they waste money on technology is they hire more and more programs that produce reams and reams of data and something like that. But the business doesn't know how to leverage that. And that's the gap you help. That's the chasm you're talking about. Yeah, because you, it, it, here's one of the key things about big data. You don't monetize the volume of big data, right? You monetize the grant, you monetize the granularity. Yeah. It's the granularity that tells Amazon what products you're likely to buy. It's a granularity that tells, when I was at Yahoo, it told me what ads you're likely to be interested in. So it's the granularity that, it's, that's, that makes the difference and you focus on that granularity. Now I can start predicting at a granular level instead of trying to predict at this aggregate level. Sure. And so and anyway, once, once people sort of go, they go, oh, well, duh, that's easy. Once you get them to understand that, oh, you can build these very, detailed analytic profiles, behavioral profiles of every one of your customers, every one of your students, every one of your technicians. And oh, by the way, you can build these digital twins, every one of your clutches and compressors and wind turbines and motors, right? You can do this at the scale of hundreds of millions or billions of items because you know, scale, is, that's not a problem. But if I get down to that level of granularity, now I can start making individualized predictions. And oh, by the way, I can aggregate those predictions up to have a more holistic view of the market. Cool. So, what are the other beyond monitoring, beyond that thing? What what are the what are the steps as you see them? So, phase one is monitoring. Then you cross the chasm to predict. Right, we call the business insights. That is to uncover insights at the level of the individual. That you then use the prescriptive analytics to optimize. So, phase three is optimize. Now, what happens as you start going, you know, use case by use case through these three steps? And by the way. What you built in your data warehouse and in your dashboards and your reports is a great starting point. It isn't like you're throwing that away, but it's only a starting point. It's not the answer, it's the foundation. But once you started doing this, what happens, organizations are starting to learn a lot more about each of their customers, each of their products, all their operations. And that allows you, you start gathering all those insights, all those propensities, all those scores, that allows you to move to the fourth phase which is the monetization phase. And by the way, we, it's not the data monetization phase, it's the insights monetization phase. Now I'm monetizing the insights about my customers' products and operations to identify white spaces, trying to know ahead of time what a customer is likely to buy so I can prescribe it to them, what, you know, what products are likely to break so I can fix that faster, right? So this whole idea of monetizing insights is, is in phase four. And then in phase five is the transformation phase, which is where organizations have totally transformed how they think about data and analytics. The economic value of data is now instrumental to the organization, which by the way is not an accounting perspective, but an economics perspective. And the organizations have changed their compensation plans to reward their employees for not only using data and analytics, but sharing the insights learned across the organization. So that's hard because compensation plans are a big bugaboo, right? And yeah. We could spend the whole talk about why, why compensation plans doom most transformation initiatives. But that's the idea is that once you get to phase five, you have this cultural revolution where all ideas are worthy of consideration with a data scientist process and thinking like a data scientist and embracing design thinking and understanding how the economics plays into it frees up all this innovative thinking that's buried throughout the organization. And one of the things we're going to learn here, Paul, I, I believe, is that the organizations that are going to be successful at AI aren't the organizations that just have the senior executives having their knowledge integrated into these models. Mm -hmm. The real knowledge in an organization the front lines, at the point of customer, that is where AI is going to have the big impact and going to enable these front lines to just be much more effective. 
Very, very cool. Very, very cool. <gasps> ah, yes. I can uh, breathe yes. now. Um, what, what I saw something in your book, The Art of Thinking Like a Data Scientist, that was an example of a store, I think it was Chipotle, making uh, decisions and the way they could use data to make some, I think that would be helpful if you recall that example to, to, give, to, give, to give listeners a, an example of something that's really granular, really specific. You recall that example? Yeah, so we, sure, oh gosh, yes, we, we use Chipotle as our, our training model for um, the universities because every college student knows Chipotle, right? A lot of yeah. food for not a lot of money. Sometimes you gotta get you know, high volumes of food. Yeah. And so we go, th we go through a process, uh, we pick a, a business initiative. So Chipotle has in one of their annual reports that they want to increase same store sales by 7%. Right. Okay. Very reasonable. Let's figure out, let's figure out how data and analytics can help Chipotle achieve a 7%, 7 increase in same store sales. And so we, so we use that example and we walk them through the eight step thinking like a data scientist process, right? To, um, identify the stakeholders who are going to be impacted by that, to identify the decisions they have to make, to identify the metrics and variables against which we're going to measure success, to brainstorm the data source we're going to need to start. So we, we walk them through that thinking like a data scientist process, not that they themselves are data scientists, but now they know how to engage with a data scientist. They know how to collaborate with a data scientist. They know how to explore data sources sure. that might be better predictors of performance. And so Chipotle is the example we use to do that because hopefully the students haven't read the book ahead of time but they always come up with different approaches it's you know when you open up the idea start the process by saying that all ideas are worthy of consideration you've unleashed the innovative power of the organization to start brainstorming ideas of how to achieve that some of them are pretty straightforward the the class typically we come back around is to understand one of the biggest drivers for increasing same store sales is is around local events for example, if your Chipotle is across the street from a Little League field, you might want to know the Little League schedule. You might want to do marketing campaigns around that so when Little League games are going on, you're driving the parents and the kids over to your store, right? So the whole idea of, of, of unleashing the creative juices is what that whole thinking like a data scientist is about, but unleashing them in a way that we can actually then work with a data scientist to integrate those data sources that that are better predictors of performance to drive operational excellence. And you drive it by hypothesis. So you brainstorm and you create these great sort of ideas and these sources of values and value chain analysis and all of the things you call it. And then you, rather than um, take them as gospel, uh, you begin to treat them as hypotheses. So this is our hypothesis, right? If yeah, in fact, if, one, of, yeah. one of the things, Paul, we do, one of, the, one of the key documents that comes out of that process is we call the hypothesis development canvas. It's a design thinking tool that we developed that details out everything the data science team is going to need in order to start the project. That is, we, all of this work, yeah. sometimes we do this from client engagements, and they might take three to ten days to do this work, but we detail everything we're going to do. You know, what's the problem we're trying to solve? What are the metrics against which we're going to measure success and progress? Who are the stakeholders need to be involved? What are the assets around we're going to build these analytic profiles? What are the decisions we're going to make? What are the costs of false positive and false negative? Like we, we captured all this together before we bring the data scientists into the process. And I really believe that the reason why our data science process is so effective, yeah, I've got really good, smart data scientists. I do, right? Yeah. But I think we cheat. We cheat because we do all this work before we ever put science to the data. And, and, and what you're talking about is a really very human process, and I think that's the thing that people don't get. So you've talked about economics, and you've talked about statistics, and false positive, false negatives, and you've talked about all of the different uh, SQL Server and all of the different technological end. But a lot of your work, it strikes me, and I know, I know you're a nerd, but a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of it strikes me is that you've really, really spent most of your time thinking about formalizing the human side of analytics. Is that, is that is human side of analytics, human side of big data? Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, I, I, I think I have been, um, like many of us, um, I've been blessed with lots of opportunities, lots of force cup moments, you know, right place, right time, not because I'm tall or good looking or from Iowa. Sometimes you just get lucky. <laughs> and one of the things that's happened to me over the last three or four years was my exposure to design thinking. Yeah. Um, I didn't know much about design thinking. Um, um, my friend John Morley, who's now on my staff, um, introduced me to design thinking. 
and uh, introduced to uh, people thought about design thinking. And as I looked at design thinking, to me, it was it was the um, counterbalance to data science. In that, if I think about data science as trying to identify and codify the trends, patterns, relationships buried in the data. Mm -hmm. Design thinking allows me to identify, validate the trends, patterns, and relationships buried in people's heads. And when I bring design thinking and data science together, it creates this really natural synergy. Both are very nonlinear processes. Both of them embrace this, uh, this basic credo that all ideas are worthy of consideration. By the way, saying all ideas are worthy of consideration doesn't mean that all ideas are good. In fact, most <laughs> ideas are just, most ideas are crap. But if you don't let everybody throw ideas up, if you don't encourage a sharing without passing judgment, because it, you don't, you'll, you'll stifle innovation. And by the way, this, this fueling of might, these ideas that might be useful, as an organization, if you don't have enough might moments, you'll never have any breakthrough moments. So design thinking and, and data science end up just meshing perfectly together. It's, it's almost striking how, how, effective, how much more effective our data science work is when we bring a design thinking process and concept and perspective into it. I do want to say, uh, I'm, 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 going to, I'm going to sound like I'm being paid to pitch your book. The Art of Thinking Like the Data Scientist has a template or, on a, or a tool on almost every page. So rather than being dense and replete with technology and all of the kind of good stuff we talked about, the kind of metrics and statistics and stuff like that, it's mostly storyboards and templates and processes and really simple workshop tools and infographics. And it's really driven to be... I mean, uh, it's almost like a toolbox. You could almost have it in your hand. You could almost have it like in your briefcase or your backpack. And you can almost pull it out and say, let me see now if there's a template that will help us think through some of these issues. And so uh, that's uh, about my fifth pitch for your book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dur I, Dur oh, well, I, I, it's going to sound like I'm on the I, payroll, bro. <laughs> I'll send you $20. Thanks, Paul. No, but it's, <laughs> what's, what's interesting about the, the fact that I um, do this with customers regularly with customers, some very large name customers, and I teach this in a class, has forced me to simplify the process. Not dumb down, but simplify. And it's, I love this quote from somebody, I can't remember who said it, who said, somebody had said, if I had more time, I'd write you a shorter letter. And yeah, I can't remember. That is I, I, sorry, I wrote you a long letter. I didn't have time to write a shorter one. Yeah, that's great. I, yeah, it's, it's great. I mean, it's, it really says that it's, it's really hard to simplify. And it's forced me to really contemplate how I position things. Because if I sit in a class and try to explain a concept, and I don't explain it well, immediately 35 hands in the class go up. Yeah. It's a great direct feedback that says, it's, you know, the problem is not theirs. The problem is mine. And so I am forced to constantly think about what is the most straightforward way to explain this concept. And so, yeah, the book is full of very simple, straightforward templates. Because let's be really honest, the data science process is really, and monetizing data is really very simple. Now, building the neural networks and the reinforced learning and all the generative and adversarial network sort of things that go on, yeah. yeah, it gets really, really hard. But I don't need to get hard so hard too early. I need to be as, as straightforward as, process, as, as possible so that I bring in the complicated data science process that I've already taken the impossible and made it manageable. So let me ask you two, some big picture questions. Uh, I, I got three in my mind. What are the obstacles to us as a world, like a business world, but also you, know, you and I have touched on politics and policy to areas where there's a tremendous amount of waste. Uh, what are the obstacles, do you think, to the world becoming more data-driven? Oh, oh, God. And, and, and then also, like, businesses uh, also, uh, you know, in parentheses. Like, what's well, in our, I, what, I what's think, in our way? Why hasn't this taken off? I mean, it is taken I, off. I, so I, I think that um, at the high school and college level, we don't spend enough time teaching critical thinking. Amen. That is that people, people need to pause and think about what they're reading. Um, if you're always going to the same website, always reading the same BS from the same BSers, then your mind is not going to ever grow. And let's be honest. It is through diversity and conflict of opinion that we will drive innovation. 
it's when we bring together different sides that we're going to create something much more powerful. Amen. So I think this, yeah. I think this this ability to, to teach critical thinking, number one, that really to to contemplate what you're reading and think about the viability of it. But number two, to embrace conflict as a way to drive innovation. Let me give an example. So back in the 70s and 80s, especially the 70s, you had a choice. You either could get fast or efficient. You either get a lot of horsepower or you get mileage. You couldn't yeah. get both. It was either or. Right. And then at some point, industry decided it's not an either or. It's an end. I get horsepower and efficiency. And all of a sudden, in the last you know, 10, 15 years, we've seen cars that have incredible amount of horsepower who get phenomenal mileage, right? Yeah. What happened is that the industry embraced this conflict, changed their view. Instead of trying to fight the conflict, they embraced it and came up with all kinds of new ideas, you know, high compression engines and, and, and lighter weight and aerodynamics and, you know, hybrid engines. And they did all kinds of great things that allowed us to get uh, end. And so I think where where as an organization, people, critical thinking and the ability to, em to embrace diversity and this end thinking, not the or thinking. Yeah. You know, uh, I really, uh, uh, we, we spend so much time as a world uh, reading stuff that we agree with that reinforces our confirmation biases. And we spend almost no time seeking out alternative perspectives. And I always warn people, it's like you should spend twice as much time reading stuff you disagree with as stuff you agree with. Like you, you don't need to be told how right you are. That is a huge, <laughs> a huge trap for us all. Unfortunately, that's not the way our social networks are structured now. It's not the way Twitter is structured. It's not the way business books are structured. So we need more contrarians, uh, I think, in the world is one thing for sure. Amen, brother. Amen. And I love critical thinking, too. I got a little bit of my book on critical thinking. It's something, too. It's like uh, when I was in, in, in school, you know, we used to read 400-page, 300-page, 500-page books and everything like that. You just can't read that much critically. You'd be much better to spend your time thinking critically about, if it was an English class, thinking critically about three pages rather than trying to digest and reproduce what was said in 300 uh, and we do yep. that, the, and we do that, and we do that in the sciences too. You know, we are not, we're not. It's an, it's an unfortunate feature of our education right now. I think it's getting better. My kids learning critical thinking in school, and um, they also have some things that you and I, uh, I would agree, they have courses that they have to take in economics and personal finance. So schools, schools are changing. I, I, I want to respect the fact that school is a very different thing than it was from us fifty years ago. 50 years ago. Is well, that having that, is that long? Holy shit. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I will say that we, we will have to reach beyond schools, um, you know, working in a university system and watching them struggle to introduce uh, new ideas and new concepts. The universities you know, are, they, the most, are the most change resistant organizations on the planet. A, I mean, if you amen. look at it this way, like if you look at a picture of an Oxford University classroom from the 1400s and 1500s, right? It's exactly the same. Some old dude talking to a bunch of things and he's doing all the talking and they're doing all the listening. And it's like this idea about pouring knowledge into people's heads and the structure looks exactly the same if I go to the University of Denver where I teach sometimes or any of these things. It looks exactly, you really haven't thought about, uh, you know, and I'm and, and working in a university and having them having to try and get universities to change or to innovate or to think more cleverly about how they engage students. Oh, what a nightmare. I'm so glad I'm not so a university I, administrator. <laughs> I, I've been very fortunate. So the, the class I teach at University of San Francisco, I co-teach with the head of the analytics department, Professor oh, cool. Muwafa, Muwafa Sadawe. And um, Muwafa has, thinks a lot like me, which is we do lots of hands-on stuff. So. Yeah, we run. It's a Thursday night class. It runs three and a half hours. There's probably 45 minutes of me blithering and lecturing, but everything else is exercises. Working in small groups, putting people into situations where we know they're going to fail, and to see what they do and how they respond and how they learn from it. So it's. I, I will say that there are there are places like what University of San Francisco is doing. Well, at least Professor Sadawi is trying to do. Uh, that we're we're they're trying to bring a different experience to students and and and. I, it's, it's great when you do that because what I find out is when I run these exercises with students, I probably learn more than they do. I always walk away with, oh my gosh, I didn't think about it that way before. And it's constantly forcing me to unlearn things that I thought were gospel so I can learn anew the new approaches. 
Amen. Amen. So tell me this, uh, tell me a little bit about Hitachi Vantara and, and what your offers are and, and what you're doing in the world and how you're putting this stuff to use. Because I think, I think, I think I want to give people as many ways of connecting with you and your organizations and your works as possible. How do they connect with Hitachi Vantara? So I'm, I'm very fortunate in that um, I, I run both the co-creation group and the data science group. And what I mean by that is we work with, a, with, a, with select customers. We have a lot of customers. We work with a select number of customers who have industry meaningful problems that they want someone to help them build a solution for. For example, just throw and, it out without, without being too, without giving away customer names or whatever, but like for example. Yeah, let's, let's say, for, for example, if you're an industrial concern, unplanned operational downtime is a gotcha, right? right. And, yeah. And there are a lot of different ways that unplanned operational downtime comes to, to comes to bear, right? Um, and most of it has to do with you know parts breaking or lines going down or you know inadvertent you know planning of inventory so the right products are at the right a, time. And it's, and it's a money pit for them. Yes, yes. And so we we work with customers who have problems. It could be unplanned operational downtime. It could be inventory optimization. It could be customer retention. And and so we go after those problems and. Uh, because we are um, a software company as well as we have a services arm, we can come in and work with them to build out solutions for them with, and then integrate their IP back into our product, and then we can roll that IP back out to other customers. Mm. So it allows us, so what I like about it is, I think it's very easy in a software company to put all kinds of features and products that you think are interesting but you never validate it with customers. Mm. I'll tell you right, right now, if you work with customers trying to solve their problems, you will put in your software features that are important to solving real problems. And very fortunate, I think I can mention this name because they've, they've announced a partnership. We do a lot of work with, with Disney. And um, I find the Disney people enlightening. I mean, they're very advanced in their use of analytics already, and they have forced our organization and have forced me in particular to think more broadly about how we're using data and analytics to help them drive a more uh, customer experience, operational downtime, uh, you know, operational perfection is kind of where they're trying to drive towards. Yeah, and you're and you're on the services side uh, as well. You're sort of you spearhead of part of that. Well, I, I, I sit in between. Right. Um, I, 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 we have a, I work with the services side, but I also work with the, with, the, with the software side because what we're learning from the customers, especially around the analytics, we're working back into our products. And so, I, again, I find myself into one of these forest gut moments. I'm not stuck in services. I'm not stuck in software. I'm, I'm doing both, trying to take what we learn from our customer engagements and weave it back into products so that we can you know, repeat it and share it with uh, customers. Got it, and uh, and so that's his, that's Hitachi. If we have any sort of B two B buyers right now, if I'm a if I'm a um, if I'm a if I'm an individual, can I just uh, like can I just like pitch up, pay my money, and take the course at USF? Oh yeah, um, well, um, you have to be a USF student. Oh, do um, you? Oh, so you don't do this? You yeah. don't do this through exec ed. You do this through uh, through uh, the, part of the MBA program. Uh, yeah. It is part of their MBA program. So these are these are these are real students who are trying to get real jobs, um, and I, I I it makes it very interesting. Now we I've have friends who come in and who will sit in the back and audit a class or two, um, but it's really designed for students. Um, is it semester long, all, semester long or something like that. Yeah, it's a semester long. We do it Thursday nights because I travel most of their time. So if you go Thursday night from six o'clock to nine thirty, you think no student in their right mind would sit for three and a half hours on a Thursday night, right? The night before a Friday. Um, but we have tremendous God, God, uptake. God, God bless them. Yeah, no, I'm sure it's full. I'm sure it's full to the rafters. Oh, it's it's full, and and they're engaged. They are. They, you know, when you when you let when you when you give these people this this student just a little bit of perspective and a, they just grab it and run. They. Their, their, their vision of the future, their hope for things that are to come is, is contagious. Oh, I love, um, I, I, love I, my, I, I love my students when I teach. I had so much fun teaching students. I, I had less fun with the university administrators. But I, I just, you know, it's so inspiring for me to hang out with, you know, 25 and 30 and 35-year-old people. You know, people always moan about the current generation, our generation, like, oh, you know, millennials. I, I, I think they're the hope for the future. You know, they've got their shit together so much more than I did when I was their age. They're so much more curious and engaged and purpose-driven, and I, I love them. They're, they're inspirational. Yeah, they've, 
they, they've got a much broader view of the world than we did. Um, I think the values they bring aren't just trying to get a job. They're thinking about social value and yeah. uh, the environment and, and even spirituality. I think they bring a much broader perspective. I think this generation is something special. Um, I, I, I can't tell you how much they rejuvenate me every Thursday night. Yeah. So I'm looking at your books now. We have Big Data MBA, Driving Business Strategies. It's on Amazon. The Art of Thinking Like a Data Scientist is actually free on Kindle, I think, if you're a prime user. How about that? Uh, you have Big Data, El Poder de los Datos. You've been uh, translated into, into Spanish and to Japanese. Thanks, Paul. It's been a blast. Great questions, and I, I hope we can do this again. Maybe in a year we'll, we'll share new learning. Well, I want, I want to be a fly on the wall of one of your courses one of these days, but uh, <laughs> all of, all of they, are, they are a blast. The uh, students and I have a fun, good time. All right. And Thanks. we do, by the way, we, we celebrate the last class by bringing Chipotle in. So <laughs> Very good. Very good. All right. All the best. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks, Paul.